Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a really interesting meeting so far, and I'm, I'm going to take you down to the molecular level, I think, farther than we have gone before at the meeting. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the role, hopefully tell you a bit about the role of uh, local synthesis of chem kinase 2, and maybe a little about the mechanisms. Um, my title is really way over ambitious. Um, I'll tell you the kind of progress we've been making on this issue. I'm also going to change the vocabulary a little bit. We've been talking about plasticity. I'm going to talk about memory, because what we do is we try to use behavior as a correlate of some of these molecular events. And flies, like mammals, have multiple types of associative memory with different phases. We have short-term memories that actually you know, last on the order of half an hour. Um, there are intermediate-term memories that you know, last for several hours, and there are multiple types of intermediate-term memory. And there's, of course, long-term memory, which we define usually as being over 24 hours. And there's probably, mole again, multiple molecular pathways. And while it, it's obvious, you know, a timing issue is sort of obvious here in that we have these different phases of memory, but there's also another interesting timing issue, and, and that is consolidation, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some of the mechanisms that are important for consolidation. And the term consolidation has typically, I think, was initiated to talk about how short-term memories are transformed into long-term memories. And I think that's a little bit inaccurate from what we know now. Um, these are probably all parallel processes. But there are things that are initiated very early that are important for, for starting these parallel processes, one of them being protein synthesis. And that's, that is what I'm going to focus on today. There's also another timing um, issue that's sort of implicit in this diagram here, and that's actually about training. So the way you train an animal will actually specify the kind of memory that you are going to be able to see later on. Short-term memories are form can be formed by a single trial of training or multiple trials that are all pushed together. And so when you train an animal like that, you get something that doesn't last for very long. Intermediate-term memories are a little they're a little squidgy. Um, you can give multiple, multiple trials. They sometimes have to be spaced depending on what kind of intermediate term memory you're looking at. Some of these intermediate term processes are protein synthesis dependent, some are not. But long term memory is thought to require multiple space trials of training um, with a particular intertrial interval. And that, that seems to be very critical. Um, there are obviously exceptions to this. There are some training trial, some training paradigms that are highly salient for the animal. Um, food presentation in a starved animal, fear conditioning. Those things basically take the express bus from single trial to long-term memory. And those are probably a little bit different mechanistically. All right, so we've got all of these different kinds of memory, but all of them need the, the neuron to have specialized functional domains. So we know that neurons have you know, a cell body. With, you know, that's where the DNA is stored. They have presynaptic term, uh, dendrites, uh, postsynaptic dendrites where information comes in, and presynaptic terminals where it goes out. You have to have specialized proteomes in all of these specialized areas. So in a dendrite, you need to have receptors to receive the signals. Those receptors have to be scaffolded in such a way that plasticity processes can happen. Um, Presynaptically, you have to have a very organized release site so that you can have high fidelity release, and again, so release can be plastic. So all of these, um, and importantly, all of these processes require localization of specific proteins to often very distant subcellular domains. And the kind of plasticity that you get actually is going to dictate how the synapse changes. So the time scale of the plasticity directs the kind of molecular change. And mechanistically, you can sort of draw a line in the sand between short-term processes. I'm just going to lump them all together here and call them STM. 
and longer term processes, which are protein synthesis dependent or protein synthesis dependent memory. And STMs, typically it's a single stimulus. You take the existing machinery at the synapse pre and post, and you modify it in some way, usually often by phosphorylation. There obviously are other mechanisms, but you're not making, you're not making new proteins. And these are reversible. These are reversible changes. And they can be either pre or postsynaptic. On the other hand, protein synthesis dependent memories actually require some, multiple, as I said, require multiple stimuli with, with some intertrial interval. They require translation. They often require transcription. And they actually involve taking, new, taking mRNAs and making new proteins and actually inserting new proteins in, into either the presynaptic or the postsynaptic cell. So again, these, these protein synthesis dependent memories can also, um, can also be either pre or postsynaptically uh, generated. So importantly, some of these, some of these localized proteins are really important um, sequela of neurodegenerative diseases. And many neurodegenerative diseases like frontotemporal dementia, um, they, they initially show very um, marked dislocations in some of the localization of these specialized proteins. So for protein synthesis dependent memories, which are consolidated memories usually, um, a lot of the plasticity related protein synthesis occurs locally. And that is probably for a couple reasons. First of all, the specificity issue. Um, you, want, you want to be able to specifically translate an mRNA in an, in an activated synapse. Um, either pre or postsynaptically. And secondly, there's a timing issue. Um, if the cell body is far away and you're making your proteins in the cell body, you've got to get them out to the synapse. And that, that actually can take time. So local protein synthesis is actually quite an important um, phenomenon in neurons. And local protein synthesis actually is very, very much regulated by the structure of the mRNA itself. So when you think about an mRNA, you think about, well, of course, it has to code for the protein. So it has the information that allows the ribosome to make the correct protein. But the mRNA also has other, other features. It's got a lot of untranslated um, code base pairs. The five prime untranslated region, or the five prime UTR, is sort of the business end of where translation starts. Um, this is where the ribosome sits down. Uh, initiation factors allow the initiation of translation. Translation goes um, in a processive manner across and then terminates down here. This three prime untranslated region, however, is very, very um, distinct in different, in different mRNAs. It can be short, it can be long, um, but it's a very information rich part of the mRNA. And the kinds of information that it contains are things that allow conditional expression of, of proteins. And many of the effectors are either microRNAs, so there are microRNA binding elements, um, but there are also binding sites for many, many different kinds of RNA binding proteins. And these, these sites can either affect the stability of, or, or the localization of the mRNA or the translatability of the mRNA. So there are repressive elements and stimulatory elements that interact with the stuff over here on the five prime end that's allowing the, the translation to occur. These three prime UTRs are modular. Um, and the things that are in the three prime UTR are very small. So the typical RNA binding footprint is maybe six to eight nucleotides. Um, they're hard, they're, they're somewhat degenerate, they're hard to, um, to recognize. Uh, microRNA binding sites, again, very, very small, the seed sequence, six to eight nucleotides. So these things are a bit mysterious, but we know that almost always when we have these sites, they can act independently. So you can move them around to different places and they still, they still work. So that's a little, um, 
primer on what the three prime UTR is. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about the three prime UTR of my very favorite enzyme, which is chem kinase two. Uh, this is a very important and very abundant and actually very beautiful, it's a dodecamer, a dimer of hexamers, a hexamer of dimers, depending on how you look at it. Um, in the mammalian cortex, it's about one to 2% of total protein, which is rather astounding. Um, that's up to the level of like actin, right? Um, it's found both presynaptically and postsynaptically pretty much in every organism. Um, it's got critical roles in memory formation in every organism that it's been looked at, and it's a very highly conserved protein. So I'm gonna talk to you about the Drosophila cam kinase too. It is 75% identical and 90% homologous to the human cam kinase too. And it also has translational regulation. So this is actually a feature of the gene in mammals and in flies. And it's been known for a long time in mammals that the three prime UTR of the cam kinase two alpha gene is really important for the localization of its mRNA to dendritic regions and for the translation of the mRNA in an activity dependent manner. So Mark Mayford um, a long time ago actually took away the three prime UTR, showed that that dislocated the mRNA, it also prevented it from getting translated in an activity dependent manner. Aaron Schumann actually <coughs> took that UTR, the five and the three prime UTR, and actually used it as a tool. So she plunked the UTRs on, the other, on either side of GFP and showed that in fact, in dendrites, you could, you, could, um, synthesize, you could synthesize GFP in an activity dependent manner, simply guided by the CAM kinase UTRs. So these UTRs clearly have a big role in how you make this protein. And in some work that I'm not gonna talk to you about in detail, we actually took apart the UTR piece by piece um, using a strategy of um, reporter genes. So we put a fluorescent reporter gene and then we put the three prime UTR behind it. We showed that in the mushroom body of the fly, which is the sort of central um, computational neuropil for, uh, for uh, associative memory, that that UTR could actually drive expression of the fluorescent protein specifically at synapses. Um, so there's very little protein in the, uh, there's very little cam kinase in the soma. There's a lot in, in the synaptic region. Um, we could mimic that with a fluorescent protein. We then actually took this UTR apart and we identified a very strong translational enhancer that out of the 2.5 KB UTR, this is 23 base pairs. If you take away those 23 base pairs, you don't get synaptic chem kinase. There's no enrichment at all. And this 23 ba base pair element binds to a protein called MUB, the poly C binding protein homolog in the fly. And when you mutate that, you take away the 23 base pairs using CRISPR in the endogenous gene, you get animals that can't make memory, right? So the UTR has, clearly has important elements for translation, um, and it's really important for establishing sort of the basal proteome of the synapse. But we were also interested in the activity dependence of the process, and so we wanted to, go a little bit further and we needed a synapse that was a little bit more cell biologically um, accessible. And so we went back to the larval third instar neuromuscular junction. So in fly larvae, um, motor neurons, inner, single motor neurons innervate muscles and we work primarily in muscles six and seven. Um, these muscles are very easy to record from you can stick an electrode in, you can record spontaneous release. Um, you can put another electrode on the motor nerve and you can stimulate, you can look at evoked release. Um, this is a very nice big synapse. So each of these little globs is a bouton. They're on order of a micron, um, whereas the typical fly cell body up in the central brain might be five to eight microns. Um, so our neurons, you know, I think 
some of your neurons are the size of an entire fly brain. Um, our neurons are tiny, so these boutons are a really, really beautiful place um, to do imaging. And each of these boutons is filled with the same protein players that you see at a central synapse in, in a mammalian brain. So presynaptically, we have an active zone complex made up of an elk cask, a cask protein called VRP. Um, that is that is complexing an n-type calcium channel called CAC uh, for cacophony because that is the, uh, it's a long story. You can ask me later. Um, CAC is in the middle of the BRP cluster, uh, just like this is, forms the T-bar, so the release site, that's where all the vesicles cluster. Um, there's a whole active zone um, region here with a lot of other proteins that will be familiar to you, RIM, RIM binding protein, things like that, synaptotagmins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this bouton has maybe up to 15 different active zones within it. Um, so it's a big bag of synapses. Um, Postsynaptically, uh, the muscle has amphitype receptors, ionotropic glutamate receptors. And those receptors are scaffolded by a protein called VLG which is actually the homologue of PSD95, right? And of course, there are things that are on both sides of the synapse that are important, including ribosomes and a whole lot of CAM kinase. And we can mark, we can actually visualize this whole complex very easily with antibodies um, or with tagged proteins. And we have a particular tool called anti-HRP, which really decorates the presynaptic membrane very nicely. So I'll show you some immuno, and we'll use that as a marker. So I told you there's a lot of CAM kinase. Um, this is actually, is it possible to turn off the front lights? Because it's going to be kind of dim to see some of these images. <laughs> Uh, maybe the answer is no. Oh, that, yeah, that's a little better. Thank you. All right, so this is uh, muscle 6-7. Uh, this is anti-CAM kinase. You can see it's in these nice um, round sort of uh, structures. That's actually the postsynaptic CAM kinase, the middle part, um, the HRP. This is the neuron. You, so the CAM kinase is both pre- and postsynaptic here. And it's also in the muscle cytosol. Now, I also have to give you a little bit of information about the tools we're going to be using. Um, the GAL4 UAS system is actually sort of the important workhorse here. It allows us to genetically specify the expression of transgenes. Um, and, when, and we can have any kind of transgene we want. We can partner this with CRISPR. It's a very, very powerful tool for cell specific. Um, for cell-specific expression. We can also induce protein synthesis-dependent plasticity at this NMJ. Um, this is a protocol that was developed in Vivian Budnick's lab. Um, what they showed is that space stimulation of the NMJ, either chemically with a high potassium solution or with an electrode or with optogenetics, as long as you gave a space stimulation and not a mass stimulation, you would get protein synthesis, morphological, and functional plasticity. Um, the readouts being bouton sprouting, so you get more boutons, and increased in, um, mini frequency, so increased spontaneous uh, release rate. And interestingly, increased CAM kinase. No, the, the sprouted boutons actually don't have a postsynaptic. They're, they're called ghost boutons because they don't yet have the postsynaptic apparatus. So the sprouting is not causative. It's actually a probability of release change. All right, so we showed a number of years ago that, in fact, the, the, more, the functional changes are dependent on CAM kinase. So here is um, mini rate in control. Um, 5x normal saline and 5x high potassium, you see about a three or fourfold increase in spontaneous release, completely protein synthesis dependent. In a cam kinase null animal, it doesn't happen. Now, 
when you do these kind of genetic experiments, the important control to do is to show that if you add the gene back, you restore the plasticity. And when we did that, very interestingly, what we found was if we did a genetic rescue where the entire three prime UTR was intact, we could completely rescue the functional plasticity. But if we deleted the distal part of the three prime UTR, there was no plasticity. Subsequent to that, we actually went back um, and made some CRISPR alleles that would allow us to actually look at this more, more um, carefully. So we have a, an allele called UDEL, where the entire UTR is deleted. Um, we then rescue that with recombination with the entire wild type long UTR or with the short um, al alternative form, um, which misses the, which doesn't have the distal UTR. And all these animals are completely adult viable um, and morphologically pretty normal. We first decided to look to see, you know, what about the CAM kinase synthesis? Um, so here we're looking at uh, 5X high potassium. This is normal saline. You don't see any change in the, um, in the CAM kinase levels. If you do the high potassium washes with spacing, you see both muscle and neuron CAM kinase go up. This is the neuronal CAM kinase. Um, and that is completely, not surprisingly, dependent on the UTR. So if you do this same experiment in a UDEL animal, there's no change in CAM kinase. Well, it's pretty clear that, that the changes are happening both pre and post. And we wanted, and we had some ideas that these might be independently regulated. So we needed to look at them independently. So we built a set of animals using CRISPR that had EGFP fused to the end terminal of the CAM kinase. So all of the CAM kinase made from this allele would be green. This is the endogenous gene. In front of that, um, tagged version of the gene, we put a stop cassette. And the stop cassette is flanked by recombination sites. So we can use the UAS GAL4 system to express a recombinase to release the inhibition of translation and, and uh, transcription of this gene in a cell specific manner, right? So we can put the green CAM kinase allele essentially in any cell we want. And it's, it's, this is the endogenous gene. So we're, we have all of the regulatory elements. When we do that, and we do it presynaptically or postsynaptically, show you two different, two different pieces of NMJ, in both compartments, there's activity dependent synthesis of CAM kinase that is completely blocked by a protein synthesis inhibitor. Okay? So there are two, on both sides of the synapse, there's activity dependent translation. Now, this, of course, doubles the number of questions. One question, obviously, being, are the mechanisms the same? Um, I'm not going to tell you much about this, but we think they're probably not because there's no MUB protein at all in the muscle. Um, so the mechanism has to be somewhat different in the muscle. But the last part of the talk I want to tell you is, uh, is about this second question. And this is something that has always bothered me. CAM kinase is such an abundant protein. Why do you need more? Um, you know, you, it goes up by 20 or 30 percent, and that, that's a lot of extra protein. And to answer that question, we had to, again, go back to our genetic toolkit and design yet another fly. So this is the same as the EGFP fly, except for now we have something called a halo tag instead of EGFP on the end terminal. Halo is actually a little tiny enzyme that can interact with the chloroalkane linker and bind it essentially irreversibly under physiological conditions. And these linkers are very small. You can attach pretty much anything you want, any different color floor, biotin, a bead, whatever you want to attach to the linker. Um, the fluorophores are cell permeant, so we can actually label with whatever color we want the endogenous chem kinase. And this allowed us to think about doing something like a pulse chase experiment. So we could take the halo tag animals, label all the resident kinase with color one, wash out the color one tag, 
then add color two in excess and do our plasticity protocol. And now the ratio of color one, color two to color one tells us um, how much new synthesis of chem kinase there was. And so again, we can do this in a cell specific way. And when we do that for the presynaptic halo kinase, what you see is there's a lot of nice red old kinase here. Um, normal saline washes, you don't get much new synthesis. Um, high saline washes, you get a lot of new synthesis of the kinase. This is all co-stained with BRP, so these little blue dots are the active zones in the bouton. And what you can see, and I, you probably can't, you don't appreciate this till you look at a lot of these images, but the new CAM kinase is showing up very closely opposed in dots opposed to the, to the presynaptic active zone. And I'll say this, this is all done with airy scan imaging, so it's a super resolution confocal. Um, we are getting a STED microscope in a couple months, so I think we, that will help us with our resolution. Um, Postsynaptic kinase is a little harder, there's a lot more of it, but again, it's showing, it's showing up, so this is a section right under the synapse, you're seeing the BRP, it's showing up, again, directly opposed to the active zones in the postsynaptic muscle. We can take these images um, and we can take the entire confocal stack that we have here, and usually I've been showing you pictures looking down on the muscle. Or, or in a single confocal section on the muscle, um, we can take those stacks and we can rotate them 90 degrees. And so in, this, in these pictures, what you're seeing is you're seeing a single bouton, but now you're looking at it from the side. And the bottom here is the part with the um, BRP. Um, so this is where the release site is. This is up at the top, um, you know, not buried in the muscle. And what you see when you look at control versus high potassium and you plot the ratio of new to old, in the control, there's no change in the positioning of the kinase. Whereas when you do the 5x potassium, what you see is you see an enrichment of the new kinase at closer to the synapse release sites. And if you look at that um, BRP intensity, that doesn't change. Um, with, with the 5x potassium, or the, the, the positioning of the BRP doesn't change, and it's congruent um, with where the kinase is. So we think that the kinase is actually going to particular subcellular domains. Um, so it's, it's really, the new kinase is clustering right around the active zone. Um, it's happening, it's you know right underneath in the postsynaptic, is directly underneath the active zone. We don't know yet um, what, what uh, it's binding to, um, but I think with the STED microscopy and other markers of the active zone, we'll be able to get some candidates for biochemically looking at this. Um, we're also looking at the molecular triggers for this using the same kind of approach um, that we used in, in the mushroom body by you know, taking the UTR and bashing it and looking at both sides of the synapse. All right, so there's a lot of questions. Um, and the very last thing I wanted to get back to was just a little teaser um, to take us back to the time scale question. So at the beginning, I said, you know, memory has all these time scale issues. Um, and how do we relate the protein synthesis to this? So what is the, the temporal structure of the training experience matters. And most people seem to think that the temporal structure is important, is instructive in causing the protein synthesis. So our expectation was that if we did multiple stimuli and we looked at the onset of protein synthesis, we wouldn't see it until after two or three stimuli. Um, and that would, that would actually um, help to specify the window during which the protein synthesis is, is occurring. So we did take a look at this. We started to take a look at this, um, going back into the adult brain in the mushroom body. So we have a plasticity paradigm that's very much like LTP um, for the fly brain. This is an ex vivo preparation. We put G-CAMP into the mushroom body Kenyan cells. We give a, a sparse antennal lobe optic tract stimulation, pair that with dopamine, which we know is the chemical that gives the unconditioned stimulus for 
associative learning. And when you pair AL stimulation with dopamine, once, wait 15 minutes and test, what you see is a potentiation. And that potentiation is pairing dependent. It's also input specific, we can show this. And it's blocked by manipulations that block short-term memory formation, uh, including TAM kinase uh, mutations. So we decided what we would do instead of looking at GCAMP was to actually put our EGFP CAM kinase into these mushroom body cells and then apply not a single stimulus, but multiple space stimuli. Now with this plasticity paradigm, we can't measure long-term memory because we can't keep the ex vivo prep alive for 24 hours. But we can look at what happens when we apply a paradigm that induces it. And so this 5X stimulation, what we did is we actually looked over time, every 15 minutes gave a stimulation, and looked at the change in EGFP CAM kinase levels. And interestingly, what we saw is they went up immediately. Um, there was no requirement for multiple stimuli before protein synthesis was initiated. So what this means is that the, the protein synthesis required for the long-term memory starts at time zero in this particular preparation, which has some interesting implications. Um, we also wanted to try to link this, this increase in CAM kinase um, with things that were important for memory. Um, the easiest thing to do was to look in sleep-deprived animals. We know sleep-deprived animals can't form STM in this, in this particular pairing, um, pairing assay. And in fact, sleep-deprived animals show no protein synthesis of chem kinase. And this can be rescued by simply two hours of sleep, um, just allowing them to sleep for two hours completely rescues both plasticity and, and the protein synthesis. So that is work in progress, obviously. I think it's an interesting observation. We're going to try to follow that up. Um, the people that did the work in the lab, Nana and Chen and Kelsey Clements, are the people that have done all of the chem kinase synthesis stuff. Muhammad Adel did all the physiology and imaging in the mushroom body. Uh, Yunpeng Zhang is a CRISPR genius. Um, and everybody else also helped. Thank you. Thank you much. Do so we have time for some questions? Very nice lesson. Um, so um, I'm just wondering, uh, there are tools available for looking at the uh, autophosphorylation state of Cam Kinase 2, I think Riohe Yasuda, and some of these, do you, I guess I have two questions. One is, do you know, you know, where and how many of these, uh, are the new CAM kinase 2 versus the old, is it, is it activated by autophosphorylation? And then the second question is really that um, there's evidence from, uh, you know, John Listman's model that there's subunit, either individual subunit substitutions, new subunits that are newly synthesized and come in and replace old ones, then mm -hmm. they can acquire that phosphorylation state. Right. Do you know anything about the activation state of, of your chemokinase 2 and does it, uh, is, it being, is it being synthesized as a holoenzyme or are you substituting individual subunits of pre-existing dodecamers? So, so there's a lot in that question. Um, we've used antibodies to look at um, the autophosphorylation and the activity paradigm increases overall autophosphorylation. We haven't yet been able to, um, to determine new versus old autophosphorylation. I mean, I think that there are some things that we can do on this line. So for instance, we have CRISPR mutations in those autophosphorylation sites. So we could make our halo tag a wild type and the, and the hetero, heterozygous allele could be a T287A. Um, so there are ways to address it. We haven't done it yet. Um, as for subunit exchange, I have a student who's actually working on that biochemically. And it certainly happens with the fly kinase, and it probably happens with dimers. 
And we actually think that when this thing is synthesized, the first thing that's made is dimers. And that might be, in fact, one of the reasons for making new CAM kinase, is to make dimers that can get put into um, existing holoenzymes. But another reason might be that it's a not autophosphorylated kinase, right? And the non autophosphorylated kinase binds to a whole different range of partners than the phosphorylated kinase does. Um, and that's given the localization difference, I'm sort of betting on number two being the more, more important reason for the new kinase. You started by saying that there are some salient experiences that can lead to an express bus to um, long-term yeah. uh, memories. Mm -hmm. Are there candidates for mechanisms that would do that, or could there be like um, a reactivation or, or retrieval that leads to something uh, like these uh, spaced activation, which uses the same mechanism? So, so I will say that. Um, we haven't done work on this, but the mechanisms underlying some of these, and, and the, the most widely used paradigm that does this is appetitive associative memory. So you starve the animal, then you give it a single trial of sugar plus an odor, and it will remember that odor for days. Um, and the circuitry that is used to make that memory is actually different. And this is work from Scott Waddle's lab. Um, so it's a different set of mushroom body output neurons that get activated by these kinds of experiences. And that probably has to do with the neuromodulatory tone of the, of the brain. Um, so it's hard for me to say whether there's reactivation. I mean, we actually were having this discussion a little bit before uh, the talk. There might be. Uh, we don't have evidence for it yet. But, but the circuitry is different for that kind of learning. I, I think the, this, this is my bias, is that I think that the idea of consolidation came from the, the observations that the behaviors could, that the memories could be observed in different time windows. Um, and there are certainly many things that if you disrupt, disrupt both short-term memory processes and long-term memory processes. I'm starting to think that the long-term memory processes are a parallel molecular pathway or, or even a parallel cellular pathway that get initiated with the training, but you don't express them as a memory until much later. It takes longer for that memory to actually become viable online. And there are going to be things that are common to both, but I don't think that the STM process has to be happening for the LTM process to happen necessarily. And there's some examples of that in the literature on fly in, with specific mutations that we know are important for LTM but don't have any effect on STM. So what happens to this enhancement of response over, let's see, not hours, but multiple days? Does it eventually sort of settle back down? It does settle back down. Um, Troy Littleton's group has done some really, and actually um, Tate O'Connor Giles, they have done some very nice work on this showing that that's probably single active zone increases in probability of release, and that, that can relax back. Um, I should say this synapse is super plastic because this animal is growing like crazy. So over five days, it, there's like a hundred fold increase in volume. Um, and that neuron, those motor neurons have to follow, they have to be able to stimulate those muscles. So they are growing and they are always plastic. So 
whenever you look at a little window here, <laughs> you have to realize that you're watching something that's moving. Do you and think then it's, it's I, I wasn't fully appreciating that. Do you think it's possible then that the rules guiding this are a little bit different than what you might see, um, for example, in the mushroom body? Oh, I think they're very different. My guess, and this is a high P synapse in general. Um, whereas I think the central synapses, in, you, you would hope for information coding are probably lower probability. So my guess is that there are some, there are gonna be differences. So, so we might not even see this kind of plasticity in the mushroom body, and we haven't at once. So, so the takeaway here is these synapses get stronger and then they stay stronger, and the rationale for that right. is that and these animals are growing the, and they're the responding mushroom, to. The, the muscle catches up, yeah. I think. I see, I see. okay. I'm, I'm just thinking about why would you have this increase in CAMK2, and, and one reason might be that you want to you know, set in place right. some mechanism to renormalize those synapses, but at this synapse, they're not renormalizing. No, so so this synapse is a little bit different. So we, you know, we think about homeostatic plasticity. We think activity. Maybe you you want to scale down. This this is just it wants to go. Um, it wants to get bigger. So then, why are these animals adult viable? If you're shutting down, uh, if you've deleted the pre-prime UTR and you're not getting the cam kinase plasticity, and the so, so relevant you, expansion than how many animals. If you look at the brains of these animals, they look shockingly normal, but they have very little cam kinase in synaptic areas. But the level of somatic kinase is exactly the same. So I think that the the um, the role of cam kinase and viability. So if you completely knock the gene out, zero cam kinase, the animal's dead before it even pupates. Um, and you, so you need some for viability. But I think that low level of somatic cam kinase is enough for the animal to actually develop and grow. It's just not enough to do plasticity. So is that simply where it is in the cell, or do you think there are different pools of cam kinase, one that's so kind of tissue, one that's activity regulated? I'm guessing that different pools have different roles. Um, we don't see the activity dependent regulation at all, and the levels of cam kinase at synapses are much lower when you don't have the ATR, but the animal's fine. And then how does the exonal cam kinase change relate to the changes in the mini junction potentials and the exonal plasticity? So you don't get the plasticity when you don't have a lot of cam kinase. Right, but what is cam kinase, can you connect those dots? I'm not sure what connection, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, you have more cam kinase in the, the bouton. Right. Why do you then get more minis? Why, why do you get more? Yeah. I, that's a great question. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that was actually my question as well, so I'll, I'll ask a different one. Uh, so cam kinase can also regulate protein synthesis. So there can be a kind of positive feedback yeah. cycle going on here. and and could some of the effects be that of having more cam kinase to amplify the protein synthesis response for other things that are actually doing the, the work as opposed to cam kinase directly? Yeah, so that, that was my dream is this, this sort of some sort of auto feedback loop. Um, the experiment we did to burst my bubble was to actually take our, our GFP reporters that have the three prime UTR and put them into the UDEL animal. So the UDEL animal has very, very little cam kinase at the synapse, and yet activity can, can robustly induce GFP if it's followed by the cam kinase three prime UTR. So the activity dependent loop doesn't require high concentrations of cam kinase. It might require low concentrations. Uh, we can't do that in a null animal, unfortunately. Thanks. Thank you.